Greetings, everyone. Happy spring. I'm Kira Epstein, the program coordinator at the New School at Commonweal. And today we are back with Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen and musician Karen Drucker, this time for a celebration of spring and renewal. For anyone who may be new to the New School of Commonweal, we are a program that presents conversations and performances. Uh, we have people who are inspirational artists and leaders and scientists, um, activists and doctors, among many others. We've been offering our program free of charge and in the spirit of gratitude for about 15 years, I think it's 16 now, and we have almost 400 conversation recordings. You can find them uh, for free on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud, or on our website, tns.commonweal.org. The recordings we will be posted on Karen and Rachel's Facebook sites and on the New School website and our other media channels. Most of you already know our guests. Rachel is co-founder and current medical director for the Commonwealth Cancer Help Program, and she's joined us many times at the New School. Great to have her back. And Karen Drucker is a keynote speaker, women's retreat facilitator, songwriter, and entertainer who has recorded 22 CDs of her heartfelt music. It's just wonderful. Finally, a big thank you and welcome to you for joining us to hear these stories and music. And we're honored to have you with us. All right, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Karen and then Rachel. Thank you all for joining us at the New School of the Commonweal. Good morning, everyone. And good morning, Rachel, you darling one. So I'm going to start off with a song before we, we, we launch into our topic for today. Do you love my, my sweater, everyone? This was a present. This is my birthday present from Rachel. I, I know it looks like Valentine's Day. I'm all hearts today. I've got my heart earrings and my heart sweater. But that's what today is about, is heart. It's what Rachel and I are all about, is just coming from the heart. And if you're with us today, on this particular day, it's a pretty big day politically. So we really appreciate that you're actually here and not watching what is happening on television with Trump and all of that that's happening today. But we are going to create a little bubble of love for us. And I thought to start off today, I'm changing my, my mind of what I was going to do. I think, I think we need to hear this message. So... So this is, um, I think we need to affirm this, that all shall be well from a Christian mystic from many years ago, Julian of Norwich, who said, all shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. So if you're feeling a little crazy today with what's happening in the world, just let's affirm this. So I'm going to ask you to sing with me. I'm not going to be able to hear you, but I'm going to know you're out there singing the chorus with me. It goes like this. All shall be well. All shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. And all shall be well. All shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. I am walking through the green pastures, and I know that I'm not alone. The song of the meadowlark sings to my soul gently. Calling me home. Here you go. Sing this with me now. Singing, all shall be well. All shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. I know all shall be well. All shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. And I am walking beside the still waters As fresh as the breeze at dawn The voice of my ancestors 
ancestors whispering, giving me the strength to carry on. I hear them singing, here we go. All shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. I know all shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. Take a deep breath, affirm that for yourself. All shall be well, all shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. All shall be well. All shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. All shall be well. All shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. All shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. All manner of things shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. Love you, Karen. <laughs> ah, that always gets me, that song. Do you know I got an email from someone who wanted to know um, who was writing your songs? <laughs> I said that. Well, that one I wrote with two wonderful girlfriends of mine, Jan Garrett and Megan McDonough. And we just, we came together and it was, we wrote this a little while ago and I recorded it recently. And it was exactly what's going on right now in the world. We just said, what do we need to hear? Right. What do we need to hear right now? Oh, yes, all shall be well with the, all the craziness that's happening in this world. But yes, Rachel, I, I write all my own songs and they usually are song. Every, whatever message I need to tell myself is what I write about. <laughs> you tell the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all are going through the same thing, it seems like. Oh my goodness. Oh, I love it. So that. anyway, yeah. so today talk about resurrection and and new beginnings and springtime. It's finally, finally warm here a little bit. The sun's out at least. Yeah, you know, it's springtime. Um after a long period where everything looks dead. Um we discover that uh, everything is still alive. And we celebrate that at Easter, the resurrection. And um, we're just going to take a moment and look at that word personally. <laughs> what does it mean, you know, to be personally resurrected? I think there are parts of all of us that we have put into a cave either because <laughs> they can't be accepted by the people around us at the time, or that we ourselves don't recognize their value. And we put them in a cave, we put a big stone and we roll it across the, the, the mouth of the cave. And, um, and they're not dead. They're just lost for a while. Mm. And resurrection is about remembering, by remembering the parts of yourself that you did not realize were of value and that you thought you needed to put away in order to get love, respect, succeed, whatever it was, whatever it was. And so you do violence to your own wholeness in order to somehow or other be more, you become less. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I have a story, Karen, but it's long. 
should I tell it now or do you want to sing another song or how do you want to go? You know, let me just, because you, I wasn't even planning on doing this, but the fact that you just said this word, this is a friend, um, my friend Melissa Flippy wrote this. Just let me set you up with this, this little chant. I am remembering who I am. Isn't that perfect for what you're saying? I am remembering who I am. So everyone sing that. So that'll set up Rachel's story just perfectly. Just say, put your hand on your heart and just say, take a deep breath. I am remembering who I am. I am remembering who I am. Now here's the next part. to yourself. I am remembering who I am. 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 So I think that sets up what this story is going to be. So take your time, Rachel. Tell your story. This is a great story that you're going to tell everybody. I love it. Well, it started in 1958 when I entered medical school. Uh, me and 79 men. <laughs> uh, a girl's dream come true, No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Every one of those 79 men did not want me there. They saw me as um, an insult to the manliness uh, of our profession of medicine. Right? So I spent four years eating alone, uh, studying alone, being alone. Right? Um, and at the end of the third year, there was a a meeting where every student got an individual interview with the heads of all the departments. This is at Cornell Medical School, one of the best schools in the country, one of the major schools in the country, in New York City. Right? So we each got, um, I think maybe a half an hour interview with the head of the Department of Surgery, the head of the, they were all sitting there, the head of the Department of Surgery, the head of the Department of Medicine, the head of the Department of OBGYN, you know, the head of the Department of Pediatrics. And I enter this room, right? And there's this long table. They're sitting on one side of the table. On the other side of the table, there's a single chair. And being that it's the only chair in the room, I go and I sit down in this chair. And they ask me, um, they, they tell me that I have an excellent record and they have reviewed, oh uh, my God, and that my record is four inches thick like all the others. Everybody has evaluated you. Everyone who's ever met you in the last four years has written an evaluation of you and um, that I have done very well and they congratulate me. And then they say, well, what, what is it? And, and they're going to write me a letter. This is the whole purpose of this meeting. They're going to write me a single letter of recommendation 
that's going to go to the residency programs and will hopefully gain me admission to the next step of my training, right? Right. So they asked me the question. The head of the Department of Surgery asked me the question. He has a Southern accent, which sounds rather ominous. And he says to me, and what do you want to do with your degree? And I tell him that I want to be a surgeon. And there is dead silence. And he looks me in the eye and he says, that's absurd. I couldn't get you into a residency program in this country or in Europe. And I'm taken aback and I say, well, maybe I could be an OBGYN and I could do gynecological surgery. And the head of the department of OBGYN says, what kind of a woman would turn to another woman at a time of crisis when they needed surgery? You'll not be able to get a practice. No one will, will come to you. Actually, this was true at the time, by the way. And so I sat there and I, I said, well, so, so what, should, what, what, what should I do? Right? And the head of the Department of Pediatrics says, well, you should do the obvious thing, dear. You should do something appropriate for a woman. You should be a pediatrician. And so I became a pediatrician because that's what I was going to get a recommendation to do. Right. And um, I, I, I was at the same hospital. I did my training at the same hospital that I had done my medical school at. And um, it was a very, very difficult experience. A very, very difficult experience. And then um, I transferred to. Um, uh, Stanford in, in um, uh, oh, wait a minute. Let me just get this story straight. Yeah. No, I, I, I transferred to, I uh, did my residency at uh, Cornell. And about um, um, the first day of the residency, there we were, <laughs> you know, uh, 30 young men and me and the three chief residents. And they were, the, the way this is done is that you have teams um, and you will be, have a chief resident and another nine people, nine new doctors with you. And you're gonna stick with the same team for three years, right? Um, and that we, we met in order to be assigned to our teams. And um, they, each one of the chief residents stood up and read off a list of names. And uh, when they finished reading their lists and they each had uh, 10 people, one of the residents only had nine. And he looked at me and he said, um, um, we drew straws and I lost. So you're on my team, right? So we began. That <laughs> was the beginning, right? 36 hours on call, awake, 12 hours off for three years, right? It's a really, really difficult thing to do. No quarter asked, no quarter given, right? About eight months into the first year of residency, um, uh, I'm on call. And it's about maybe three in the morning, and I get a call for an emergency. There's a woman uh, who is delivering prematurely th twins, very, very small babies, and they're rushing her into the uh, delivery room. And uh, they need pediatricians. They need someone to help keep these babies going, uh, if, if, if they can be kept going at all. And uh, they need me there quickly. And I throw on my outfit, my right thing with the, the neck and the buttons and my white jacket, my white skirt, my white shoes. I grab my stethoscope and I start to run downstairs in the house staff residence to the tunnel that connects underground between the house staff residence 
and the hospital. I have not been outside for six months. <laughs> and I get down there and there's my chief resident on my team and he's waiting for me and we run down this tunnel we run into the uh delivery room and we're there for maybe 10 minutes and the delivery begins and these babies are small i can hold one of these babies in the palm of my hand and i'm handed the first baby and i we have a table and i start working on the baby trying to get it to breathe trying to be sure that it's warm enough trying to start an iv on it uh, and this is all in miniature. And I look next to me and there's my, my chief resident. He's got the other baby equally as small. And we're both working away and we make it. We stabilize them. They're breathing. Right? And they come over from the neonatal intensive nursery and with special uh, containers to be able to transport these very delicate little lives. And we put the babies each in their container and they take them to the neonatal uh, nursery and we are done. It's now 4.30 in the morning, right? So we start walking back through the tunnel to the house staff residence to get whatever sleep is left. And we're walking side by side. We're exhausted, both of us, walking side by side. And suddenly, without looking at me or even breaking step, he says to me, you know, I owe you an apology. And I said, yes. And he said, yes, yes. You know, I didn't want you on my team. And I said, yeah, I, I knew that. I know that. Yeah. He said, but I was wrong. Working with you is like working with any man. I was thrilled. This was the high point of my professional career today. I was thrilled. Whenever I was disheartened or things were too heavy, I would replay this in my mind, that working with me is like working with any man, right? And we get through this residency, and I get a position at Stanford. And I leave New York City, I go to Stanford, where I, I have a position which is really, first of all, I'm the only woman on the pediatric faculty the only woman on the pediatric faculty at Stanford, but I'm not, I'm barely on the faculty. I'm the manager of the pediatric clinics where all the subspecialties are in the general care, a lot, lot of action, a lot of people, but I'm the manager, right? I have to be sure there's sheets in every room and your stuff like that, okay? And uh, I'm, I'm there for maybe about a half a year, and my opposite number, my opposite number comes in one morning and he's carrying a bunch of mimeograph sheets and they're all different colors. And he says, Rachel, Rachel, I think, I think we should do this. I said, do what? He says, well, you know, they're doing a research, a research project um, and they're looking for doctors, your regular doctors, and they want a dozen doctors to come down to this place called the Esalen Institute, and uh, for, for once a month for two years, and and they um they want to uh, have us examine uh you know uh, uh does medicine have anything to do with healing, right? And I said to him, that's absurd. <laughs> Why should we go there? He says, Rachel, it's beautiful. It's on a cliff on the edge of the ocean, and it, oh, it's absolutely hot tubs, naked people walking around in the sun. It's absolutely beautiful food, and you know, the food is all vegetables, and it's absolutely wonderful, and, and it's free, and we should go. Now, when, when your future knocks on your door, and it very rarely looks like what it is, but I recognize this one immediately. I had just broken up with my boyfriend. He couldn't stay in the, the 36 hours on and 12 hours off. He, he just, he was gone, right? And I recognized this, this was mine. What a great way to meet men, right? So I went, I signed up right? and I did. 
I met men. I met Abraham Maslow. I met the Dalai Lama. <laughs> I met Joseph Campbell. As a matter of fact, he was the first person who gave a weekend for us, right? I remember sitting down and he was showing us pictures of spiritual uh, art, big slides. And one of them was exquisite. It was a dancing figure. Um, uh, and it was, it was a, the God, right, dancing. And it was dancing on the back of a little man who was crouched, this is a little statue, was crouched down in the dust, looking very intently at something that's between his hands, and that something was a leaf, right? He's studying this leaf, and this, the living God is dancing on his back, right? And we were, this is projected on a wall four feet high, and all of us looked as if we were overwhelmed by it. And we said, what is this? And he says, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a statue of, uh, you know, of the living God. He is dancing on the back of this little man. I said, well, well, what is this little man doing down there? What is he studying? He says, this little man is so caught up in the study of the material world that he does not know that the living God is dancing on his back. And then he looked at us, all 10 of us or 12 of us, and said, that little man is a doctor. Right. So this was a, a tremendous experience. And um, I began to remember things, you know, I had put the woman in me into a cave and rolled that stone in front of it. But she wasn't in there alone. There were other, there were other things in there with her. Um, there was a young woman who was a philosophy major at Cornell before she went to medical school. She almost didn't get into medical school. I was almost not allowed into medical school because I had an irrelevant major philosophy, ethics, what is human nature, what is possible, right? Oh, absolutely irrelevant, uh, irrelevant uh, uh, major. Right? And the philosophy major was in there with the woman, yeah? And then there was a little girl who had a grandfather who was a mystic, who was a student of Kabbalah and rabbi. He told wonderful stories and talked to God many times a day. And he had taught her to talk to God many times a day, discussing every aspect of her life with him, right? The little girl was in that cave as well, right? And slowly the stone began to roll back, right? The stone began to roll back. Now, all the time this was happening, I was at, at uh, uh, Stanford, right? And I got promoted from the manager to the assistant director right, of the pediatrics clinic. And I, I actually had a tiny little office with a bookshelf and a desk, but there was no chair. And they gave me a hundred dollars. And my name was on the door. You're Rachel Naomi Remen, MD, assistant manager, right? And I didn't have a chair. So they gave me a hundred dollars to go and buy a, a chair for the desk, right? So I go to the Sanford Shopping Center with my hundred dollar check. And I go to the furniture store and I walk in. The first thing I see is on a shelf, there's a white statue of a woman, beautiful white statue. And she's an Asian woman. She has a a jar of water, and she's pouring water onto the ground. And I am riveted by her. And I recognize her. She is mine. And I go over there to pick her up, and she costs $100. Now, I don't have $100. I do. I have $100, but it's for a chair, right? And so I put her back down, and I um, buy the chair, right? 
And then I go back and uh, life goes on as, 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 as usual. And about three weeks later, I have a night terror. Now, those of you who are pediatricians know what this is. It's not a nightmare. It's worse than that. It's an experience that you're dying. It's awful. And little children have this, and occasionally an adult will have it. And I have a full-on night terror. And in this night terror, this little, this, this, this statue uh, has come to life. And she's calling out to me, don't leave me behind. Don't leave me behind. And I wake up, and I can't, literally can't breathe. And I turn on every light in the house, and I'm shaking like a leaf. I said, oh, my God, isn't this awful, ridiculous, terrible, terrible, right? And then, you know, I can't go back to sleep, but I go to work the next day, and life goes on. And two weeks later, the same thing happens. I have another night terror. And I say, all right, if I don't eat lunch for two weeks, uh, for two months, I could buy her. I, I could save $100 and I, and I could buy her. And that's what I do. I don't eat lunch for, for two months. And I, I buy the statue and I bring it to the office, right? Uh, and I have no place to put it. There's no place to put it in my house. And, it, you know, it's too small. And, you know, so I put her on my desk where she just sits for the next three years in my line of vision as I direct the hundred men that I am in charge of. <laughs> right. Thanks. Um, and then things go on. And I, I, uh, I'm now the assistant director. And um, I have a whole different idea about medicine. I have a whole different idea about what it means to be a human being. Um, I no longer see medicine as science. I see science as a tool of medicine. I see medicine as a spiritual path, one of the oldest in the human race. And what this means that we are called to medicine and, and all of this. And here, these 12 doctors, we're all on the same path together. And we have been, to some degree, transformed by all of this. And then I really get a promotion. And I'm um, I called into the uh, office of the, the head of the Department of Pediatrics, and he tells me that uh, they have appointed me the director of the pediatric clinics. And I'm getting much closer to my goal, which is to be the first woman dean of a medical school in the United States. I made that decision when I was sitting in front of those four doctors that told me that I had to be a pediatrician, that I was going to be a pediatrician, but my way. <laughs> right. And so I'm, I've, I've got this promotion. Right. And I go home. And that night, I have the nightmare that I hadn't had in 18 months. And the little lady is there again, and she's saying, don't leave me behind, and don't leave me behind. And I wake up, and I have again the experience I'm dying. And then I say to myself, this is real. I am dying, <laughs> right? I can't do this. I'm living in two worlds. One of them, I belong in. And the other one, is different than that. And these worlds belong together, but they're not together. And I, maybe that is what I'm here to do, is to help these worlds come together. Right? And suddenly I can breathe again. It just lifts. It just lifts for me in the middle of the night. And so the next morning I go and I call up the director, the, the dean of the, the head of the Department of Pediatrics, make an appointment to see him later that afternoon. I walk in, he congratulates me on my appointment, and I resign. Right. And the 
things that you have put in your cave, and everybody has a cave, they're not dead. They're just waiting. They're just waiting for you to come back for them. And often they are parts of your life that are very central to your identity, to your purpose, to your mission. And they're very much also part of the mystery, which is every human being, right? So I just wanted to say that we are all in the process of resurrecting ourselves. Some of us will roll back that stone and some of us won't. But remember that the cave is there and something is waiting for you. Something that belongs to you. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to say. So Rachel, add the part though about what when you finally found out what that statue was. Oh, there's another piece, yeah, the last piece. So I I I I am sent to my office and people are in shock, right? Sent to my office and I look around and I have a few things in the desk, like my pens and a couple of other things, and nothing belongs to me. In the office, all the books belong to Stanford. The chair, the desk, everything belongs to Stanford, right? And I have two things. I have the sign on the door that says Rachel Naomi Remen, associate, assistant director, whatever. That belongs to me. And the statue that's on the desk of the woman pouring water out on the bed. So I, I take the statue, put her in a box, I'm on with a sign, and I go into my, I put her in my car, and I drive home, right? And I'm home for about three weeks trying to say, what have I done? I have no job. <laughs> you know, this is really I, I, a very, very difficult time. And some of my friends from Esalen are doing something up in, in San Francisco, and they're passing through, and they come to dinner. And they, I'm making dinner, and they arrive, and I've got the table set, and um, the, the statue is on the, the dining room table where I had left her. And uh, one of the, the my guests takes a look at this and says, oh, Rachel, you have a statue of Kuan Yin. And I said, what? And he says, Kuan Yin. I said, what's Kuan Yin? He says, oh, one of the most powerful of the Asian goddesses, Rachel. She's the goddess of compassion, so central to the practice of medicine. Don't leave me behind. And I didn't. I didn't leave her behind. Yeah. I had to let go of a lot. Somebody else is the first woman dean of a medical school. Yeah. Well, I think you found your path, your true path. And in case some of you don't know what she looks like, this is, that's, this that's, is that's, one version. Of I this. have nine versions of her in my house. After we talked the other day, I went and looked. I've got big versions, little versions. Here is my paperweight. <laughs> you have the most beautiful collection. I mean, I love, you have so many. I have I have about four in, in my room here. They surround, they're on every corner of my little office here. But yeah, you are, and you are the, the vision to me. You are the... Um, the embodiment to me of Kuan Yin. Oh, what a lovely thing to say. Thank well, you are, Rachel. And, you know, I, I, I have to say to all of you out there, you know, you get to witness um, with us doing this. And we're so grateful to Kira, you know, to allow us to have this time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is what my relationship with Rachel is, is I just sit at her feet and just say, tell me more stories. <laughs> and at you get to witness. Side, my side of it is my, my life is filled with music. Well, it's, long. it's, it's, it's fabulous. That's a great story, Rachel. It's so inspiring to hear all of your different stories. And, you know, and for those of you who don't know, you know, these are these stories are in her in her two fabulous books. But um, it's so great to hear you do it live. Well, I have a I have a song I think I'll I'll sing. This is a 
this is my version of rolling, you know, coming out of the cave and finally saying, you know, I'm just going to stand in my power here. So hopefully my cat will not sing backups on this. You can see him walking by and I saw your cat going by. Oh, it's all right. He can, if he does that, let's see. Um, 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 where is this song? Okay. Ha! Ah. I was a little girl who never spoke her mind. I couldn't rock the boat. I couldn't cross that line. But every step that I've taken, every pain, every tear has led me to the woman who's standing right here. And I got so tired of giving myself away Always looking for someone to tell me I was okay But I got to the place where I could trust my heart It was the perfect place for a brand new start All right, here's the part I want you to sing with me I'll teach it to you goes like this. Here I stand in my power. Here I stand in my power. Here I stand in my power. Here I stand. Here I stand. Let me teach you the movements. You could go like this. Here I stand. Stand in my power. So you just put your hands here and then I put it down. Stand, stand in, my power. in my power. Here I stand in my power. Here I stand. Here I stand. And I am a warrior. I am invincible. I am strong as steel and I am capable but I am soft as a feather light and free and the truth that I know healing begins with me all right you can stand up if you want when you sing this here we go here I stand in my power roll away here I stand in my power Here I stand in my power Here I stand 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 So this is my favorite line of the whole song And with all that I've been through There ain't nothing I can't do And now here I stand in my power All right, stand up and sing this to yourself now Here I stand in my power Claim that for yourself Give it to yourself deeper. Here I stand. resurrected me, the new me, letting everything else go, standing in my power. Mm, here I stand.
wow, loved it. <laughs> so let's let's open this up, Rachel. Let's um let's put this out to everybody on our chat that I'm looking that they're all saying things. What is what do we want to ask them? What is something that wants to come into fruition now for you? What is, or do you have a question for Rachel? Someone said that they wanted to see my statue again, so here it is. This is a, this one, if you can believe this, I, Rachel was amazed at this. I got this at a garage sale for $5. <laughs> they obviously did not know. We're both hunters, yes. Hunter-gatherers. <laughs> Rachel and I, our favorite thing to do, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little piece of information about the two of us. Our favorite thing to do is to go to thrift stores and garage sales. And this is, this is, a, <laughs> this is our favorite thing. Hey, and you know, one little thing as you're thinking about what you want to, uh, to, to ask Rachel or put out to the group here, um, we're actually going to be doing something live and in person. What a concept. We're going to be on July 8th. We're doing a, a, a live in-person little afternoon workshop in Tiburon, California at Community Congregational Church. And it's going to be all about the wisdom and the power and seeing through your heart. So just uh, that's information's on my website, but I just want to put that out. So anybody have any questions or comments that you want to say here in the chat that we can talk about in our few moments that we have left. Uh, what Carrie said, thank you for breaking glass ceilings and for being true to yourself. That was truly a glass ceiling that you went through, Rachel. And that's, you know, to really trust your heart that much, especially when you got to the pinnacle of what it is that you wanted to do, what courage it took for you to say, you know, this ain't it. Well, you know, it didn't feel like courage. It felt like I had to do this or die. Uh, that I was dying. That I was suffocating in some way. Yeah. And I had no idea. Um, I didn't have a plan. I didn't have anything. All I knew is that I, I didn't belong there. Yeah. It was something else. Yeah. Lynn is asking, do you still have the statue from, from that time at Stanford? Do you still have that, that your, quant, your original oh, Kuan yeah. Yin? Oh, sure. She's on my dining room table. Oh, yes. I've seen her. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, one of the songs, I, I won't sing the whole song, but there, there was a, a song that I was going to sing here today about, about this. I'll just give you the chorus. And it's just about when you have a call, when you feel something in your heart. Um, I see. How does it go? So listen to this. I feel the call of something more. I feel the call to be someone I've never been before. I feel the call of something more. I feel the call and it's asking, what am I here for? What am I here for? What am I here for? What am I? And I think that's sometimes what we have to do when we're going through this resurrection. What's the rest of that song? What's the rest of that chant? All right, I'll give you a little bit of it. There's been a storm brewing inside of me. Clouds moving around my heart. Because something's changing that I can't see. I love this line. I'm stuck in what I know is safe. But not yet where I'm supposed to be I feel the call of something more I feel the call to be someone I've never seen before I feel the call of something more And I feel the call and it's asking What am I here for? 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 I'll give you another little bit of the verse because I love this line. They say pain pushes till the vision pulls. It 
Feels like my safety nets have all fallen down I wish I had a map of where to go But I've got this feeling in my soul That when I get there, I will know I feel the call of something more I feel the call of something I've never felt before I feel the call of something more And I feel that call and it's asking What am I here for? 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 I think that's the question we have to ask ourselves. What are we here for? What's calling us? What is our heart saying? What are we being called towards? That's what the resurrection is to me, Rachel. You know, that you you take away those... Well, now we're going into what we were, we were talking last night about the different uh, um, things we're doing coming up in in February, and excuse me, for Mother's Day, Father's Day, and we were talking about Independence Day and saying, well, what does that mean? You know, and talking about freedom, and maybe that's what resurrection is, is that you 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 trust your heart and you break those those all those shackles that were around you with all the men and uh, trying to be something and to allow yourself to just say, no, I don't know where I'm going, but I've got to get out of here. And mm-hmm. Kuan Yen was going, yes, Rachel, please do it. <laughs> please. My little statue is going to say, please. Don't leave me behind. Don't leave me behind. <laughs> oh, I think there's a song in that for me to write too. Mm-hmm. Oh. <sighs> well, you know, the whole concept, we're trying to become something more. And the whole concept, this radical concept, we all may be already the person we're trying to become. Yeah. <laughs> um, that um, we're each one of a kind. We, a person like you has never existed in the history of the human race. Never. Not once. And, you know, that's when you realize that, that you're a unique happening, you let yourself happen. Yeah. Oh, you let yourself happen. I like that. Just let it happen. Mm -hmm. Whoever you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Get out of the way. (laughs) Well, I am certainly glad you let yourself happen, Rachel. Because of that, we've gotten your wisdom and these wonderful books and this time every month with you to just listen to your stories. Yeah. So I think when we talked last night, you were saying that this, the, the, one of the songs that sums it up for you is um, There Is Only Love. Do you want me to end with that? Do you have anything else you want to say? Just There Is Only Love. Okay, so... Or is this? So this is a song by Michael Gott. I wrote just the little verse, the second verse. But I want you to sing this with us. I'll teach it to you. In this moment, in this place, I remember who I am. Letting fear and worry just fall away from me. I open my heart and I can see that there is only love. There is only love, sweet love. It's a love that heals. Love that sets me free There is only, only love And when I lose, when I lose myself In those times 
When it feels like I have lost my way I go inside And quiet my chattering mind That's when I can hear spirits say All right, everyone sing with me now There is only love Just that line again There is only love Love that heals Love that heals Love that sets me free There is only love There is only love Sing it all again There is only love There is only love There is only Love that heals, love that heals, love that sets me free. There is only love. There is only love. Again. There is only love. There is only love. Love. Sets me free. There is only love. Now bring it into a prayer, really soft. There is only love. There is only love, sweet love. It's a love that heals, love that sets me free. There is only, only love. There is only what we have here today. Just love. Just love. Love yourself. Love everybody you see. Just love. Love. Just love. I see all these little heart emojis are coming up. (laughs) (laughs) That's sweet. Thank you all for all the (laughs) wonderful comments you're saying to to us and all the little hearts and everything. And thank you, Kira, for having us again and Ken for helping us out with all the behind the scenes. Absolutely. Rachel and Karen, just amazing. I'm so grateful to spend an hour with you again. And Rachel, that story, I've heard that story before, and it is such a powerful one, um, especially for me and for all women who are listening. Just really appreciate you pioneering in that way that you have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And the music, of course, is just numinous. I love the music, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. We have more music and story events coming up with with Karen and Rachel. We have one on May 16th and one on June 20th. We hope you guys can join us. Um, Just a reminder that you can rewatch or re-listen to the conversation or share it with others. You can also find them on tns.commonweal.org and on all of our media sites and Rachel's Facebook site and... um, And a reminder that Karen has a lot of other events and offerings, and you can find out on her website, karendrucker.com. So much gratitude for all of you who have joined us and are joining us uh, in the future, listening to our recordings. Thanks for being with us at the New School at Commonweal today. We'll see you next time. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, 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 don't, 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 don't take it, don't, 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 don
never feels no way. 